right, well, good evening. And on behalf of the UVA Club of Savannah, welcome to tonight's program. As I know that some of y'all know, uh, for years now, UVA Club and the Georgia Historical Society have had a wonderfully mutually beneficial relationship, a very close relationship, where we have put on programming together over the years. And tonight represents the latest opportunity for us to continue that tradition and, and to continue and maintain that relationship. Uh, very pleased here tonight to have uh, Dr. Uh, Sid Milkus from the University of Virginia. He'll be speaking, as I know that y'all are aware, with our very own Dr. Stan Deaton. Uh, Stan does such a good job of these programs, these conversations, really, and I'm very much looking forward to it myself. I would like to thank the University of Virginia for uh, facilitating this, for bringing Dr. Milkus down and, and arranging this. We, we couldn't do it without UVA, of course. Tonight's uh, presentation, tonight's conversation, I think is especially relevant given that we are in the midst of an upcoming election campaign, and I know that's going to touch on uh, that for sure. So with that, I will sit down and uh, turn the mic over. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, and good evening. Everyone, thank you for being here. I'm delighted to see all of you out tonight on this rainy evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Todd Gross. I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the Georgia Historical Society, and I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. As we begin the program, I would like to express my thanks to several people and organizations that have helped to put this on this evening. First of all, the UVA Club of Savannah for partnering with us on this program tonight. And Althea, thank you for being with us tonight. Brooks, thank you for being here from the University of Virginia. Thanks for joining us this evening. I want to thank St. John's Church and its rector, Gavin Dunbar, for allowing us to hold this program in this beautiful sanctuary. The Book Lady Bookstore for providing selections of Dr. Milkus's books, all of which will be available at the end of the program this evening. And I would also like to recognize any members of our Board of Curators, if they are with us tonight, would you please stand and be recognized? I didn't see anyone coming in this evening. Okay. Well, tonight we are honored to welcome Dr. Sidney Milkus, the White Burkett Miller Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Virginia. In just a moment, Dr. Milkus will be joined by Dr. Stan Deaton, the Elaine B. Andrews Distinguished Historian at the Georgia Historical Society for a wide-ranging discussion on the topic of the promise of self-government, history, and American democracy. This is the first of many programs scheduled as a part of the annual Georgia History Festival. The Georgia History Festival is the Georgia Historical Society's signature K-12 education program that teaches history to over 250,000 students across the state each year. The theme of this year's Georgia History Festival is governing Georgia across three centuries. During the course of the academic year, Georgia students will study how the American experiment in self-government has evolved over the last 250 years to meet the challenges of an ever-changing nation and its people. The Georgia History Festival has many sponsors and supporters from across the state. I want to recognize and express our deep appreciation to Kreitz Auto Group for sponsoring tonight's program, as well as our other lead sponsors, UPS, Chick-fil-A, Delta Airlines, Georgia Power, The Home Depot, AT&T, and the Coca-Cola Company. Will you please join me in giving them a round of applause? For more information on the other events and programs and resources that are connected to the Georgia History Festival, please visit the official History Festival website, which is georgiahistoryfestival.org. That's also noted in your program. Tonight's program with Dr. Milkis also marks the beginning of the Georgia Historical Society's commemoration of the U.S. 250, the semi-quincentennial of the United States. Try saying that five times quickly, semi-quincentennial of the United States. Over the next three years, as we approach the 250th anniversary 
of the Declaration of Independence in July 2026. The Georgia Historical Society will explore historical themes and history-related questions to help all Georgians connect and engage with our American story and better understand who we are and where we are going as a nation. So please stay tuned for new programs, publications, and, and events that are related to this national anniversary. And one final thing before we bring up tonight's speakers. I want to invite you to support history education by becoming a member of the Georgia Historical Society. If you are already a member, thank you. I deeply appreciate your support. If you have not become a member, please consider doing so. And this, everybody received a membership brochure when you came in the door. Teaching history, and I've been in this business now for over 30 years, teaching history has never been more important than it is right now. History helps us to better understand what it means to be an American. The essence of who we are is contained in the story of our nation. You can do your part to strengthen America by joining thousands of others in becoming a member of the Georgia Historical Society. So please do so. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. And now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Stan Deaton and our special guest, Dr. Sidney Milkus. Thank you, Todd. And let me echo his welcome to all of you. We deeply appreciate you coming out on a wet night and uh, with all the ample parking that there is around here. We deeply appreciate that. Um, let me also join Todd in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Sid Milkus. He gave him a nice introduction, uh, gave you his official title at the University of Virginia, political scientist. He's the author of this book that you see here, What Happened to the Vital Center? And uh, Sid wanted, to tell me, uh, wanted me to tell you all that the, uh, the program tonight will be utterly incomprehensible to you if you don't buy a copy of his book <laughs> on, on your way out. And we also have a copy of his book, Rivalry and Reform, Presidents, Social Movements, and the Transformation of American Politics. So pick one of those up on your way out. So, Sid, we're going to talk about a lot of different things here this evening. Uh, we're going to go for about 25 or 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So without any further ado, we'll jump right in here. Um, Todd mentioned that this is the beginning of the Georgia History Festival, and we're focusing on 300 years of Georgians governing. So the first question that I want to ask you, because Georgians and all of the American colonies on mainland North America uh, were, had roughly the same kinds of government, our political traditions are English, British, even though, of course, the people who came here were from many different places. So my question to you is, why then did our government, both in the colonies and then later with the Constitution, develop the way it did? Why don't we have a parliamentary system? Why don't we have a prime minister instead of a president? Yeah. That's an easy first question, don't you think, guys? Uh, <laughs> I always like a softball to start. Can you all hear me? because I'm not practiced at using this kind of mic. Um, so uh, I think in uh, his, his uh, comments, Todd said that, um, that uh, American government is often referred to as a, as a grand experiment. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's, uh, it really was a radical innovation. We've, you know, when you think of the Constitution, you think of it as conservative, but really it was a radical innovation. And what's so radical about it is uh, that we have uh, a president uh, and that we have a, a, a country, a large and diverse society in which the, the government rests. Uh, and before the American Constitution, uh, it was thought uh, that you could not have a, a, a strong executive and a democracy. You could have a monarchy or a democracy, but you could not have a Republican executive. It was also, also thought uh, that uh, before the American Constitution, that if you're going to have a democracy, the scale had to be small. It had to take place in a small place because if it takes place in too large and diverse a place, that makes uh, anything that deserves to be called self-government um, 
a, uh, a, a mirage. It just simply can't work. The government will just be a vast vagueness, and it will be dominated by elites. That's cool for a monarchy, but it doesn't work for a democracy. So to get to, <laughs> to the essence of Stan's question, in the beginning of the Republic, after the Revolution, uh, most uh, of the colonies, New York was the one exception, formed highly decentralized governments where almost all the power was vested in the legislatures. Uh, and uh, there was a governor, but the governor was elected by the state legislatures, and uh, that constrained the governor's power. But to further constrain the governor's power, so these would be state republics rather than aristocracies or kings, uh, m most governors were also uh, tasked with what was called an advisory council. Uh, which was made up of members of the state legislature and sometimes the courts. And so this is kind of a proto-cabinet, like the British cabinet, uh, the, the combination of a, a governor who's boxed in by this collective responsibility of, um, of an advisory council, and the sovereignty basically resides uh, in the legislature, just as it resides in the parliament, in a parliamentary system. Um, so, uh, and also the Articles of Confederation a lot of my students don't know we had a government before the Constitution, and they're smart kids, but we had the Articles of Confederation right after the Revolution from 1781 to 1787, and the government there kind of mirrored the government in the states. Highly decentralized, the states were basically sovereign. Um, all the, all, virtually all the power resided in the Congress. Uh, there was a president, um, but the president really pr just presided. Uh, over the Congress, and I always ask my students, who was the first president <laughs> uh, of, of, the, of the United States? And most of them say John Hancock, because, you know, he's the one who signed the Declaration of Independence with those big letters, so the king could see his signature without wearing his reading glasses. But it was really somebody nobody's heard of, John Hanson from New York, who got so bored by not having anything to do uh, that he went home af after, after a, short, uh, a short time. Uh, so we, we were really, there was a possibility at, in the origins of the Republic that we would develop into a parliamentary uh, system. That seemed to be the direction we were going. So why didn't we move in that direction? And, and I'll, I'll give, uh, I've already talked a bit in, in, in answer to this question, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a short answer. I could talk for the rest of this time about why we moved uh, to, the, to the government we did, but I'll, let me just mention three things. One. As most of you know, the Articles of Confederation were, were a disaster. Uh, it could neither control domestic affairs, simple things like the things you expect a national government to do, like uh, regulate interstate commerce or, or uh, uh, have uh, uh, command the borders and international relations adequately. Articles of Confederation failed miserably in that. Uh, and, the, and one of the precipitating moments that capped these, this failure that led to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia was Shays' Rebellion, uh, which took place up in Massachusetts, in the western part of Massachusetts. A farmer's rebellion by debtors led by uh, one of the first populist leaders in American politics, Daniel Shays, who was a Revolutionary War hero. Uh, and uh, this was a, 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 a debtor's rebellion. This, and, and what made it particularly scary for people who cared about law and order, like George Washington, was similar events were occurring in all the states because there was, there was really serious conflict uh, between the debtors and those who held their debts that came from the Revolutionary War. Uh, but this one up in Massachusetts was really gained momentum. They shut down the debtors' court, and they were heading to Springfield where there was an armory, and it looked like and it was going to be an armed rebellion. And there was no executive, either in Massachusetts or the national level, to put it down. Uh, and, and so finally, uh, some um, businessmen with the support of a very weak governor were able to mount a sufficient mil uh, militia to put down the rebellion, but this scared the hell out of people like George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, those who felt from the beginning that the Articles of Confederation were going to be inadequate. So that, that, I think, is one reason, the disappointment with the Articles uh, and the fact that uh, that uh, you had an armed rebellion that seemed like it was getting out of control. The second thing is George Washington. Is somebody who looks like a Republican president is sitting there. And George Washington was president of the, uh, uh, of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, without him being there, I don't know if there would have been 
enough faith in the possibility of creating a Republican executive uh, as there was. And sure, he would only be there temporarily, but George Washington was the guy, the kind of guy who could set precedents, walk on untrodden ground, uh, and, and establish some precedents that would be followed after him. And, uh, and he was particularly attractive because he was a strong leader, very intimidating. I could tell you stories about how intimidating he was. As, as uh, forbidding as the Washington Monument is, as unaccessible as that. But he was trustworthy because he was not, he, at least he came across, at least he played the part of someone who was not hungry for power. And one of the things that really convinced people of how trustworthy Washington was, was that in 1783, after winning the, leading the, the victory in the Revolutionary War, he turned in his sword and went back to Mount Vernon. And this not only uh, left people in the, in the country in awe, it left the world in awe. Because it really had never happened before that a military hero had voluntarily given up power and returned to private life. Uh, and and I, uh, I read a quote from George III saying, this is going to make Washington a world historical figure. Uh, because somebody like, in our, in our history, uh, a Marlboro, uh, somebody like that, or Cromwell, they did the opposite when they had military victories. They demanded more power. But this guy rejected power for a while. Um, and then, so I think that's a second reason. And the third reason, there was this ambition in, in the United States to be different. Uh, to be exceptional, to, to uh, be an example of a grand experiment in self-government on a grand scale. Uh, and the country, uh, what the Constitution does is take power away, primary power away from the states and gives it to the national government, which will preside over a large and diverse society, an, an individualist, individually based society that would be rather atomistic. Uh, it would be hard to manage. Uh, and Madison argues in the Federalist Papers that this is a great thing because this will do what's unique to American democracy. Uh, we care about rights, not just majority rule in the United States. And a large and diverse society would make it difficult for a majority to form that could repress the rights of individuals. But on the other hand, how are you going to govern this place? Uh, and so th the argument that developed in the, Continental, in the uh, Constitutional Convention was that the country needed a first citizen. They needed someone uh, with enough respect to attract people to the center of the government and respect the national government and, and, and not view it as simply this vast vagueness. Uh, and so it was viewed that the president, and in particular Washington, would be essential to that task. In fact, in the beginning, uh, uh, people didn't know very much about the national government. And the only thing that made them think it was a respectable uh, collection was George Washington being the first president. So that, may, that may have been a little longer than you wanted. No, that's all right. Um, <laughs> you uh, also, I think, the Constitutional Convention debated having multiple presidents, right? Yeah. Not just one, but yeah. one from each region, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the only thing better than having one president right now would be having three, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, one, one, if, one in each region, right, guys? <laughs> one in the West, one in the right. South. Right, part of the reason that didn't One happen. in the North. Yeah, part of the reason that didn't happen was because they trusted Washington right. with power. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, but there was a big debate, uh, yeah. nevertheless, even though they trust Washington. Uh, ben Franklin, who's the founder of my school, the school I went to, University of Pennsylvania, said, yeah, Washington's going to, he may set some precedents, but somebody very dangerous may, may replace him. And the first uh, debate that really ignited the convention was whether to have a unitary executive or a plural executive. Uh, and Edmund Randolph from Virginia said, you just have a single executive. That is the fetus of monarchy. And he's the one who proposed that we have three presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, and that debate went on for a while. It was very, it was very heated. Uh, but in the end, uh, for the reasons that I've mentioned, those who, who defended a, a unitary strong executive, in particular, Alexander Hamilton, the hip hop star. Uh, I wish I could afford tickets to go see Hamilton, but <laughs> you think a presidential scholar would get Gratis tickets, but it hasn't happened for me yet. <laughs> and, and also this guy named Gouverneur Morris was also a big defender mm -hmm. of the exec from Pennsylvania. So the document that they created, um, ha of course, has been hailed across almost 250 years uh, as being this profoundly democratic document. And yet, there are, there's a, a huge school of thought. There's a new book out called Tyranny of the Minority by, mm -hmm. by two of your colleagues. Um, who are arguing that the, the Constitution is profoundly 
counter-majoritarian, that it is really anti-majority. It's an anti-democratic document. Yeah. Looking at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison wanted the Senate to be represented by population like the House was, and he didn't get his way. Instead, yeah. Wyoming and Delaware have two senators, just like Texas and California and Florida today. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree that, this, that the Constitution is a very, in some ways, anti majoritarian yeah. document and that the Senate is part of that? You know, Stan's been asking me this question ever since I got to Savannah, and he keeps trying to put me on the spot. <laughs> Headline, Milka says Constitution is anti-majoritarian, anti-democratic, and I won't take the bait. <laughs> so, so the Constitution was designed to be a republic, not a pure democracy, uh, and people like uh, Madison and Hamilton, uh, the people who wrote the Federalist Paper, John Jay, um, argued that uh, the Articles of Confederation, which was more democratic than the Constitution, showed that pure democracy uh, 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 can bring out the worst tendencies of popular rule. Uh, and, and, and the thing that Madison worried most about was mob rule. And mob rule, which would infringe on the rights of individuals. And, and mob rule uh, would, would occur because uh, a pure democracy without guardrails without institutions that check the majority, would be vulnerable to a demagogue. This is the great, the, the Federalist Papers begin and end with expressions of, of fear about a popular demagogue. Somebody who Hamilton's, Hamilton's definition of this is very good, I think. Somebody who uh, flatters the prejudices of the people in order to betray their interests. You, you know, you just praise them, you don't, you don't try to lead them in any way that, that, that uh, doesn't uh, recognize uh, that some ca caution may, uh, may be necessary. So Madison argued that the Constitution uh, as a republic would be superior to a pure democracy because you would have what he called a system of successive filtrations, starting with the House of Representatives and going up to um, the President, the Senate, the President, and the Supreme Court, which were further removed from the, from the reach of, of the people themselves. And he argued that, and a, and a lot of people were opposed to the Constitution, and it was a very polarizing debate. Uh, everybody reads the Federalist Papers, not enough people read the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, the Anti-Federalists were a very strong opposition. This was the first really polarized conflict in, in the United States. The Anti-Federalists argued this, this isn't a republic. This is a uh, republic dis um, that is uh, uh, this is a republic, uh, uh, this is a monarchy or an aristocracy uh, disguised as, as a republic. You are not refining and enlarging the voice of the people as you claim with these successive filtrations. You are muting the voice uh, uh, of, 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 the, of the people. Um, but, but in the end, um, the argument, uh, 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 the Federalists won, won out. But that's, that's been an ongoing debate. Uh, in American politics. It was really at the center of the rise of Jacksonian democracy in, in the United States, which we could follow up. And it's, it's become, so periodically this has emerged, this debate. Is the, is the Constitution really a refined, improved, more perfect, as the preamble says, democracy? Or, or is it uh, a, a, a monarchy or oligarchy disguised as a republic? And that, uh, I don't know if we're having the, the most vibrant debate over that now, compared to ones we've had in the past, but it certainly is a, is a, is a strong issue uh, uh, now. And these colleagues of mine, uh, did you, some of you may have seen them interviewed on CNN if you haven't read the book a couple of, you guys watch cable television? My wife and I have a bad habit of watching cable television, and then we can't sleep, you know. We, <laughs> we toss and turn <laughs> in, in, in our, in our uh, night, uh, nightmares. They feel uh, that the, that the um, that the guardrails that are designed to constrain majority rule have become so powerful and intractable that now we don't have a republic, we have minority rule. We have the kind of oligarchy border, you know, leaning towards a monarchy that the anti-federalists warned about. Well, and one of the things that comes out of uh, our political development as a country was something that either wasn't foreseen by the founders or simply dreaded, and that was, of course, the rise of political parties. Right. Parties are there to institutionalize political opposition, right? Mm -hmm. So that we're not out in the streets killing each other. The, the opposition is institutionalized, and you need to have them. My question is, has that worked out well for us, and why are there only two parties here when 
yeah. countries in Europe have many, many, many. Why yeah. is there just sort of a, a, a divide and conquer? Yeah, let me, let me take the second part of that first, because that's easier to answer. The reason we don't have a multi-party system from time to time, we have third, important third parties that emerge. Uh, I wrote a whole book, and it's not for sale back there, so <laughs> I'm not marketing myself too aggressively here. But I wrote a whole book on Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party campaign in, in 1912, which was a really important uh, third party. But the third parties like sting like a bee, and then they die. We've never had an ongoing multi-party uh, system for two reasons. One, we have first passed the post form of elections. We don't have proportional representation. And so that tends what, to... What do those two things mean, past the post and representative? Yeah. That means whoever wins a plurality gets, is, is, uh, is elected to the office, yeah. Now with the presidency, you have to win a majority of electoral uh, college, but you don't have to win a majority of the popular vote. Lincoln won 40% of the popular vote in, in 1860. Whereas if we had a PR system and you were given representation, you know, according uh, to the proportion of votes you got in, in an election, like, in, like England has, or, uh, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, not like, not that France has, England has, a, uh, then you would, then you would uh, be more likely to have a multi-party system. Uh, England has a first-past-the-post system. They have mostly a two-party system, but they'll get some third parties uh, in, in addition to that. So there's a Scottish Nationalist Party now. But England has a first-past-the-post system, but they don't have a presidential system. And the presidential system is the, is the ultimate prize. And so it tends to focus uh, the, the, and you have to win a majority of the Electoral College to become president. And so that has tended to discourage third parties uh, from, becoming, uh, from emerging in, in American politics. Um, the Constitution was designed, I, to, to, be to, to get to the first part of your question, the, the Constitution was designed to be a constitution against parties. <laughs> and particularly the presidency was designed to be an office that would constrain, moderate, partisanship in the United States. So in, in the original Constitution, all electors got uh, two votes from the Electoral College, uh, but there was no uh, mechanism uh, to, um, to, vote for, to, to vote for a party ticket, that each elector would cast two votes for the presidency. And one, who, and one had to be, they had to come from different states to make sure like a big state like New York wouldn't get all the votes. Um, and, uh, and the person who got the most votes, if it was a majority of the Electoral College, would become president, and the one who came in second would become vice president. So if we still had that rule, wouldn't this be delicious, guys? Uh, Joe Biden would be president, and Donald Trump would be vice president. <laughs> isn't that something fun to, to you know, isn't that, isn't that fun to fathom? Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, well, well, we actually had uh, two political opponents in that position uh, after the election of 1796. We had um, that uh, John Adams won the most votes, Thomas Jefferson won the second most votes. And, and, and so John Adams became president, Thomas Jefferson uh, became vice president. And they, they were political opponents, but they were pretty good friends at, at, the, at, the, at the same time. But what, what led us to, uh, to change the Constitution, make it possible for the party system to arise, was there was a tie in 1800. And those of you who've seen Hamilton knows what happens. Uh, that Jefferson was clearly the nominee to be president of the, what was called the Democratic Re Republican Party. Who was nominated to be vice president? Let's see what, give me a shout. Aaron Burr, <laughs> one of the more dastardly characters in American politics. They tied because there, even, they, by 1800 parties had formed, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican parties were clearly in opposition. They had different, different visions uh, for, for the country. But the Electoral College had no way to distinguish between Jefferson and, and Burr, so they got the same amount of votes. Now, in most cases, uh, I'm getting when I growl, I'm really getting excited. <laughs> in, in most cases, the vice president would do the honorable thing, right? That's uh, all right, I'll defer to Tom. But Aaron Burr was very, very ambitious, and so he did not defer uh, uh, to Thomas Jefferson. And you had a real crisis because the lame duck Federalist uh, House of Representatives got to decide which Democratic Republican would become president of the United States. And everybody knew Jefferson was more principled, but Burr was more pliable. <laughs> and so the Federalists liked the idea of having a guy in there who was a little corrupt and they thought they could control. So this went on for days. It almost led to a, a civil war before in, in the early part of the Republic. But eventually Hamilton stepped in 
and persuaded enough Federalists that the right thing to do was to elect Jefferson. And enough Federalists abstained, so we got, um, so, so uh, Jefferson became president. Out of that, in 1804, uh, we got the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, which allowed electors to cast one vote for president and one vote for vice president. Uh, and this, and this um, uh, allowed uh, for the party tickets to be nominated. And then the party system grows out of that. And then it's, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, there's a question about whether it'll really last because factionalism is very controversial in, in the United States. The original Constitution pro, uh, sought to constrain it. But during the Jacksonian period, it was viewed as a way to make sure people uh, both got out, got, uh, uh, were, were encouraged to get out to vote. Uh, and, and also it was what my colleagues in, in a typical political science ease way call, it was, it, it was a heuristic for voters, a way for them to figure out the important differences between the candidates when there were rival teams. It became clear uh, about, uh, the voting choice became something people could readily un understand. And, you know, Jacksonian democracy mobilizes the country in a way that had not happened before. So what role did the Electoral College play uh, in, speaking of anti-majoritarian elements yeah. of the Constitution, uh, the Electoral College, what role has it played in restricting us to two parties with this winner-take-all approach that we have here? In, in what role has it played in restricting? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Is that, it has, that, has it played a role, I guess, is the question, in restricting us to just two parties? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it has. I think if we went uh, to a direct election of the, pres of the president uh, and the president had to win a majority of the popular vote in order to be elected, uh, what, what would happen is, I think, in the first round, so this would be like what France has now. The first round, there'd be a lot of parties competing, uh, and then the two top candidates would, uh, would, would, uh, um, would run in a, in a, in a follow-up election to decide who would be the president. So France has that kind of system, and they have a lot of parties in, in France. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it has. I, I, I also think it's, it, it's worth pointing out, uh, because, uh, because um, these two scholars you mentioned who called the Electoral College so anti-majoritarian, uh, was democratized quite a bit during Jacksonian democracy. So the, the original, uh, the Constitution uh, gives the power to choose electors or to decide how electors are to be chosen to the state legislatures. And this is the way it pretty much was up until the Jacksonian period. But after the very controversial election of 1824, and I won't go into detail on that, even though William Crawford, a Georgia guy, was right at the center of that, uh, a after that, uh, most states moved to a popular election of the electors. So the Electoral College is not perfectly democratic now, but it, it's much more democratic than it was in the original, than a lot of people thought it was in the original Constitution. So we could have a discrepancy between the Electoral College and the popular vote, and we've had two of them, right, in the last 20, in the last couple decades, but there's not as big a discrepancy as was possible before Jacksonian democracy. Something like the 1824 election is unlikely to happen. Yeah, we've already worked the Shays Rebellion into this conversation. Yeah. We don't probably don't want to work the 1824 election into it. I, yeah, but, that would so, be too. That would be too much. I mean, so uh, <laughs> as we, we'll do that in the Q and A, right, guys? You all want to ask about William Crawford? Yeah. <laughs> so as we go along through here, the development. So we we have these political parties that are here to institutionalize political opposition. Mm -hmm. So now tying into the title of your book, what happened to the vital center? About time. Yeah, it only, it only took a little while. So the idea that political parties somehow keep us from killing each other, and we've now reached a point where we not only see the other side, whatever it is, as the opposition, but as an existential threat to the survival of the republic. How did that happen? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think the first thing to say is, and, and I think this is, the founders got this wrong. Uh, I think democracy, a republic, necessarily involves conflict competition. Uh, I, I don't know if it's that William Crawford's ghost or <laughs> um, necessarily involved conflict. And, you know, no sooner had the Constitution got, uh, started than um, rivals began to argue about what it meant. Uh, and so it became apparent uh, pretty early on, clearly by 1800, uh, that it was impossible to have a Constitution that was above parties. So you had to develop a party system that was somehow consistent with it. How do, as you were saying, Stan, how do we institutionalize this competition? So it doesn't lead each side to view the other as an existential threat to their way of life, as, as not only an opposition, but enemies. 
and, 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 but dangerous. So the answer in, for most of our history was that the parties were highly decentralized and catch-all parties, um, uh, which, which prevented the kind of national polarization that we have now. And that was consistent with the development of American politics, which was highly decentralized uh, even after the Civil War, up through the New Deal uh, of the 1930s. Uh, the emergence of the presidency as a powerful office, and this really occurs for the first time during the 1930s, tends to nationalize parties and to put the presidency at the center of our competition. And that has created a kind of uh, winner-take-all form of party competition in the United States. Add to that what happened in the 1960s when uh, battles over American identity really emerge with a vengeance in the United States when people really begin to challenge Jim Crow, and there's fundamental struggles over that. And there's all, all these other social movements that emerge in the wake of the civil rights movement, women's rights, uh, LGBTQ rights. Uh, and so um, the, the New Deal led to a certain amount of polarization that was very dangerous, and we could talk about that in some detail. The core, pa core packing plan, for, for example. But as, since the 1960s, when we've been struggling uh, about what it means to be an American, uh, who's in and who's out. Uh, that, that kind of conflict is very hard. Uh, to, uh, makes it very difficult to reach compromises. You can compromise over Social Security payments. Although at my age, I like them to be, ma ma I don't like to compromise. I want them to be maximized. <laughs> but it's very difficult, as we've seen uh, guys, and when I say guys, I'm from Philly, so it's, it's a gender neutral term. So uh, as we've seen in, uh, in the case of, the, of abortion, that's a very difficult issue to compromise. It leads to a kind of existential struggle where the parties represent fundamentally different ways uh, of life. So I, I think what's happened is the parties become much more presidency centered, much more nationalized, and driven by culture, st cultural struggles uh, that have brought us to a very dangerous point in American politics. So I've always defended party competition and polarization, and I still do, and I can defend it if you want me to, but I've, but I've, I've gotten much more concerned about it than I used to be. So participation in a democratic system is founded upon and based upon voting. And of course, there's nothing in the Constitution about voting. That was left to the states. Uh, and we've been arguing about it ever since as to who, yeah. that, who, who, who would do that. Um, we know that during the Jacksonian period, it kind of widened out to be universal manhood suffrage mm -hmm. after the Civil War extended for a brief period of time to black males, uh, to black men, and then the fight was on as to whether women would be involved, and then, then black women, many of whom could mm -hmm. not vote until the Voting Rights Act, and, but we still haven't got this figured out. We're still arguing about who can vote, where they can vote, yeah. how they can vote, whether or not when they vote, it's legitimate. How did that happen over 230 years? How do we still not got that part right? Well, I just think you have to, you know, if, if, if you're in England, the, the fault line has always been class. Uh, and class identities are really very powerful. In the United States, uh, identity is our fault line. And race is the most important one. It's not the only one, uh, but it's the most important one. We've made progress. Um, I, I don't agree with those who say we have, you know, that. Uh, we're experiencing Jim Crow too. We haven't made any gains. That the civil that the Civil War amendments and the Civil Rights Revolution didn't change things. It's very obvious to, to me. Who grew up, had my my formative years in the 1950s. Oh, I'm really aging myself here. In the 1950s, <laughs> in, in Philadelphia, that things have changed dramatically in, in our country. Uh, and and uh, um, ra uh, there's still a gr some a great deal of racial tension and inequality, but not, not nearly as much as there was before the 1960s. Uh, but uh, with every movement, there's been a counter-movement in American politics. And I think the movement has, has generally won out incrementally, sometimes more than incrementally, but there's always been pushback. Uh, it's, not always, uh, it's certainly not always about racism, sometimes it is. It, it's about um, what kind of society uh, what kind of way of life uh, people think should be celebrated in, in the United States. And now one of the fault lines is whether um, we should have a race-neutral society, and this is argued by conservatives, 
or whether we, we finally have reached the time in our history where we, should, where we, ha we can have a multiracial democracy. And, and I think that's, that's not as fraught as, as the battles over Jim Crow, but it is a serious uh, debate in American politics. And you know, if you read Martin Luther King's speeches, you can hear him, you can pick out things that he says that support both of those positions. Uh, so I, I think what's happened is we've made great progress, uh, and with that progress, uh, the questions about American identity, which used to be episodic, civil war, you know, reconstruct, are now a routine part uh, of, of our politics. Uh, and there's this kin continual, uh, this never-ending battle for complete equality in the United States. Um, but it's very difficult to reach that, that situation, whether you're talking about race or any other quality in, in American politics. Tocqueville said, the, you guys know who Alexis de Tocqueville is, right? This great visitor to the United States. A French aristocrat who wrote probably the best book on American democracy. And he argued that the more equal things become, uh, the more unquenchable, un unquenchable? <laughs> the thirst for equality uh, becomes. But you can never reach a point where every, everybody's equal. In England, that's a battle over class. In our country, it's over identity. So the last thing I'm going to ask you before we open it up to questions is, on the cover of your book, for those of you who didn't see it or can't see it, but under your title, you have a picture of what happened at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. So my question is to you, wouldn't the founders sitting in Constitution Hall in Philadelphia have said, this is where democracy always leads, and this is what we were trying to prevent? Um, <laughs> By the way, we wrote this document and the government we gave you, what happened? Yeah, this is the chickens coming home to roost, in other words. Um, I always find it kind of weird to get into the mind of Madison, <laughs> people like that in the 1790s. Um, but I do, think, um, I, I do think that some of the problems we have now is those, many of those um, filters that Madison felt were important to, to, um, uh, to moderate democracy have been weakened considerably. And I, I think one of the, there's two things I can think of real quick that have done that. One is the media. Uh, which, which I think Sid Milkus needs to write a lot more about. Um, you know, I know the media is important, I just can't figure out exactly why uh, it's so important. But I think social media, my students think uh, social media is very important for what's, what's going on now. The other, I think, is, is the growing power of the presidency, executive aggrandizement, which has really weakened our system of checks and balances and has really distorted the party system. So that much of our party politics now is not about the different ways of life that people uh, are, 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 are contesting, uh, but about pers the personalities uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the people in the White House are contesting uh, for the White House. A, a cult of personality, even in the case of Joe Biden, has become very central uh, to our politics. So I would point to, the, to those two things, and both those things would have, I don't know if it would have upset the, the the power of the presidency would have up, upset Hamilton very much. And actually, he and Madison by the 1790s were arguing about how far the, uh, powerful the presidency is. But they both would agree that we've weakened many of the checks and balances that used to be so central to the working of the American Republic. And guys, the more I write about presidential aggrandizement, executive aggrandizement, the more I think I need to write a book on the Congress. Because it's impossible to envision a republic without the rule of law. Settled standing laws. It's, a, it's, a, it's just the foundation of what a republic's about. Uh, and we, have, we no longer uh, are, are governed by the rule of law. We are now governed by executive decree, uh, by administrative action, by dueling administrative action of the two parties, uh, which I think has uh, uh, really undermined the foundation of, of, of republican government in the United States. All right, let's, uh, so we're gonna open this up to the floor. Um, if you'll raise your hand, we've got folks who will bring a, a microphone to you. I implore you to please ask a question, not a statement disguised <laughs> as a question. So. Protests are accepted. Right, right down here, right up front. Wait for the mic to come to you. Hello. 
Thank you. Uh, recently, there was a TED Talk uh, by a woman whose job it was to study the factors that bring countries to a civil war. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she said all those factors currently exist here in the United mm -hmm. States now. Would you comment on what you think is inevitable or possible? Yeah. Um, as, as a political scientist, I don't say anything is inevitable. You know, physicists can say things are overdetermined. <laughs> I always believe that there's, there's room uh, to, to uh, change the situation. Uh, just, just like the Constitutional Convention was a choice to move to a different kind of government than it seemed we were going to have, I think we can change things now. But we are definitely in a dangerous place. Uh, and you know, we've had crises throughout our history and there've been different causes of these crises, polarization, economic inequality, battles over uh, 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 American identity, uh, and um, there's one more. That, that, oh, exactly. <laughs> of course, the presidential scholar forgets this one. Executive aggrandizement. But what's scary about now is all four of those causes of crises in the past have now emerged, have now converged. And we have all of those things now in American politics. Uh, and I'm particularly, um, I, I've been focusing in lately on economic inequality because I think if we could do something about economic inequality, particularly the tremendous differences between cosmopolitan areas and rural areas, which is really at the center of many of our battles right now, uh, I think that might ameliorate these struggles over identity in, in, in some way. Um, so I've helped, uh, I've helped uh, form a, uh, uh, an institution on, uh, on the relationship between democracy and capitalism now. Uh, and that relationship has become very, very fraught. Uh, so uh, I, I do think we're in a dangerous place, and I've been arguing that we need to look uh, to economic reform and particularly do something uh, about the differences between rural and cosmopolitan areas. I, I was just reading about something about the Rural Electrification Administration, how Roosevelt brought electricity to the South. There was never this North-South divide during the New Deal. Roosevelt, in his, in his four runs for the presidency, can you imagine he got elected four times? And I think if he had not died, he would still be president uh, of the United States. But by bringing electricity to, to the South and rural areas, it really helped to ameliorate these geographical conflicts. So I think Joe Biden, ought to, or whoever's president, ought to bring the internet um, to rural areas and, and, and certain parts of the South where, where it's missing, uh, but particularly to even out the playing field between rural uh, and urban uh, areas right now to, to really have a dramatic program like the New Deal had with, electric, with electricity for the internet, which is absolutely essential now, right? We saw this uh, during the, the pandemic. Something like that, you know, it's a small step maybe. I think we need to move in that kind of direction. It seems that uh, today, uh, whenever an institution of government, whether it's a court, a department, an agency, you know, Congress itself, whenever an institution uh, makes a decision with whom, quote, the other side disagrees, it attacks and tries to delegitimize the institution, mm -hmm. uh, in which obviously erodes public trust in the very institutions that the Constitution created you know, to, to make the system work smoothly. Uh, and of course, it, it comes back to bite you uh, eventually. So why, why, where does this come from? What, what is it that has caused us to uh, say, not that I disagree, uh, but this institution has no legitimacy? Uh, well, that's, a easy, another easy, that's an easy question. To, I, I think, um, there's always been kind of a, a, a um, concern in the United States with institutions that put any restriction on individuals. Uh, creating strong institutions has always been a challenge in the United States. And, you know, we think the Constitution was ratified and then everything was fine. We had the Civil War. <laughs> and, and periodically in our history, we've challenged the, cons the Constitution. Uh, where I think that became uh, less episodic and more regular is the 1960s. The 1960s, 
you know, I, I, I've been thinking lately I want to write a capstone book. Not that I'm old enough to write a capstone book, but I, I'd like to write a capstone book on the Great Society because I really don't think we've done justice in figuring out what an important period that is and how, how, how much it, 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 it just tore the country uh, apart. And with, with the, the explosion of, of, uh, of um, uh, with the fracturing of the country over issues like civil rights and Vietnam, when we're talking about patri what does patriotism uh, mean in, in the United States, uh, people really lost faith, particularly on the left, to the notion, but I think it's also happened on the right, to the notion that America is a city on a hill, that it's a beacon uh, for, the rest of, for the rest of the world, showing them how to engage in a great experiment in self-rule. And a kind of antinomianism and anti-institutionalism came out of the 60s, uh, both on the left and the right, that has eaten away at the vital center of, Amer of American uh, politics. And How to revitalize the Congress, how to revitalize the courts, how to revitalize state governments. Think about how nationalized our, our federal system uh, has become in the United States. And, and you know, you and I could have several drinks over how uh, we could do that. Maybe we should go out later uh, and, and, and do that. Um, but, but you know, it's really interesting. Even the presidency, can you guys still hearing me or my? Oh, it, oh, good. Okay, <laughs> this has restored my faith in this in this institution that I got. That, that, that I haven't, I've never been blacked out before. I've been in this business four decades, and I've never. This is a first that happened in Savannah. But I won't hold you guys personally responsible. Even the presidency is interesting to me because uh, everybody um, wants to use the presidency to serve their causes. Um, the Progressive Caucus in the Congress right now is really pushing Joe Biden to do something uh, unilaterally about gun control. And the presidency has kind of become a weapon of the parties, of party objectives in, in the country. But that has lessened, not increased respect for the institution uh, of the presidency. We've seen this with the attack on the bureaucracy, which I know reached an a, a culmination in the Trump presidency, but Democrats have also been engaged in it. And it's a fascinating paradox, guys, that. Everybody wants to use the presidency, uh, but half the country hates the president. Uh, and, and so I, I think you're, that question is right on point. Uh, and one of the themes of this book is we need to think institutionally. And how our, as Stan has been interrogating me up here on what happened to our institution, and is it a conundrum we can work our way out of? Oh. Um, the theory of the pendulum says that Western societies swing back and forth over an 80-year cycle between uh, a polarized groupthink over to a focus on the individual. And 80 years ago, we were in the midst of World War II. 80 years before that, it was the Civil War. 80 years before that, it was the American and French revolutions. So we're 80 years, we're at the height of the group thing. Yeah. Do you, in your studies, does that theory hold any weight with you? Is it perhaps human nature that we overcorrect and we swing back and forth mm -hmm. as societies? And if that's the case, can we do anything in advance to sort of see it coming and perhaps ameliorate the conflict before it gets out of control, which it seems like maybe we're heading that way? That's a great, great question. I'm glad you did the math for me. <laughs> Sid, how many years have I invited these things? Um, I do, I am very interested in, in what some people call critical junctures in, in American history, American political development and world. I hadn't thought of, you know, uh, I think about this mostly domestically. And so you mentioned the American and French Revolution, right? Um, and, and I think one of the things I think is interesting, but I haven't studied it enough, is generational change, that if you look at many of the major changes in American politics, they've occurred when a new generation emerges in, in American politics. And Jefferson had great faith in this. Jefferson felt that this would keep the Constitution alive. 
that, that each generation would have the opportunity for itself to decide what the Declaration of Independence meant, to decide what the Constitution meant, and what the relationship is between them. And I was talking to Stan about this today, he probably doesn't, I don't know if he remembers, but I was saying that one of the problems in American politics now might be the baby boomers. And, and I confess, I'm a baby boomer. People who had their formative political experience in the 60s, which is such a fraught period, and tends to view politics in this fraught way. And you think of the major, some of the major players in our politics that have led to polarization uh, over the last several uh, years, people like Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton, uh, they really are part of this baby, George W. Bush are really part of this generation. And I have to say, um, uh, one of the reasons I'm still teaching is because I love my students so much. And there's something about this generation of students, um, and, and maybe it's just UVA. We, UVA's on this side, right? I think it's weird the way you guys divided up in the tribes. I mean, can't you guys get along? And <laughs> I think we're going to start getting out of our polarization by getting you guys to sit together for, for a while. I'll, I'll give you directions in, in a moment. So it's possible a new generation is emerging that's far enough removed from some of these, the, you know, the, the falling apart of, of America, uh, that, that, they'll begin, that they'll begin to view the polarization we experience now as childish. And I've heard my, my students refer to our polarization as childish. That don't get all uh, bent out of shape when you have to talk about difficult issues. Uh, I've, I have found my students, um, and, and I really think there's been a caricature of what's going on in universities now. I haven't found them against freedom of speech, unwilling to talk about things. I think there are people like that at universities. They get disproportionate publicity. But on the whole, I've been delighted with the capacity of my students to talk about the issues that Stan and I have been talking about up here. So I don't know if that directly gets at your question, but I think this idea of generational change is something that might, might lead to important change in American politics. Right, right down here. Right. Yeah, and there's one on this side, too. It's not working. Oh, it's not. Oh, it works. Oh, there, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I apologize if I don't phrase this in the way that I intend for it to. I, I'm very concerned about the um, influence of money in politics, in Congress, in the Senate, in the presidency, in state and local governments as well, and Citizens United and that whole deal. Yeah. Um, camp campaign finance reform, because it just seems like that has insidiously impacted the faith that we as citizens have in our elected officials when we start learning about the enrichment that has occurred to them as a result of their election to these positions and the influence that that bears on the decisions that they're making on our behalf. Can you speak to that and how we deal with that? You talked about the economic issues, yeah. you know, more um, citizen-wide, yeah. but in terms of the influence that that bears politically on what does happen legislatively. Mm. Sid, we have three minutes. Go. How long do I have? Three, three minutes? But there's another question. We, we, <laughs> so I don't have three minutes, I have a minute and a half. Yeah, that's another thing. You, jo you should join this gentleman and I for drinks later on so we can sort this out. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, I was an expert witness in the McCain-Feingold case, and, and I was against those reforms because they took uh, they made um, the parties less important in campaign finance and opened it up to outside groups and interest groups uh, like unions and, and corporations. And for all the problems with the party organizations, at least you can say that, what, that they are uh, very, tra they're very, um, uh, there's no way they can, they can uh, um, have dark money. Everything they do is transparent by, by, by law. Moreover, um, by uh, the parties uh, controlling a little bit more of the money in campaigns. Uh, campaigns can be about the principles of the party <laughs> and not just about uh, in, in individual personalities. Um, and one of the things that the reforms have done, and Citizen United accentuates what McCain-Feingold did, is it, 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 it brings us, like, it, it brings us the worst of, of, of both worlds. That it, brings a lot of money into politics, 
uh, and it brings money into politics, it's irresponsible. <laughs> so, so some of the most, I think, bombastic, destructive forces in American politics come from big donors uh, in, in, the, in the United States. So, so I think we need to figure out a, a sensible way to regulate um, uh, of, uh, campaign expenditures, uh, which, which respects freedom uh, of speech. But I think the Wild West we have created is, is a very dangerous, very dangerous thing. And it, and it benefits incumbents, I think, because you're going to, you know, you're going to bet on those who, who have the best chance to win. And, and we, I don't know if this, the, uh, um, this, um, um, this, uh, I'm thinking, I'm blanking on the word now because it's getting towards the end of the hour. Old age people, <laughs> really, uh, geriatric, you know, our, our politics do dominated by uh, geriatric uh, leadership uh, relates to this, but I think it has something to do with it. But that's just a simple, not an adequate answer to your question, but I think it is something to worry about. But I want to give this, I know there was a gentleman over here who had a question. Last question. You're, you have to sum this all up, sir. You mentioned media, and uh, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, informed electorates. Um, it's kind of troubling to see uh, newspapers folding around the country and yeah. reporters getting laid off, so there's very few uh, journalists out there. I work with journalists a lot, and I see how hard they used to work to get the story and then yeah. to get the facts right. And with the proliferation of media beyond newspapers, it seems like there's, um, there's not the accuracy in, in news and other things, and our, it's affecting our uh, informed electorate. Yeah. Um, Stan was talking today about how in 1996 you get the founding of both Fox News and NSNBC, right? This kind of pol polarized media founded in the, in the same year. I think the decline of local news, I think local self-government is really important, and I, I think, you know, your next, I would love to give, come back and give a lecture on that, on that sometime. I don't think I'll be welcome after the blackout, but <laughs> maybe you'll tolerate me. And the decline of local newspapers, I'm seeing it now with the, many of you know the Daily Progress in Charlottesville. Oh man, it's a, it's a shell of what it once was. Um, they, it only comes out three times a week and they mail it to you. It's not delivered to your, to your driveway. I think there's a real problem that one of the things that's caused everything to, to focus on the center and, and, and makes us think we're in a winner-take-all situation is, is, the, is the way the media uh, ha, has developed. I think another problem is, uh, the, um, and this goes back to the question of a loss of faith in institutions, um, one of the things I disagree about with my students about is they have lost faith in our elections and, and the electoral process. They do not want to go into, uh, they do not run to one, want to run for office because they think it's all about money. It's corrupt. They all want to work for nonprofits. Write me a letter, Professor Milkis, for an internship. Um, and, and I think that is a real problem because I don't, for all the respect I have for edu public education and civic education, that's not the way you become a citizen. Tocqueville pointed out that mores, the habits of the heart, only develop through practice, only through, ec through participating in things like the electoral process. In, and I think we ought to have uh, same-day elections. We ought to make it a holiday and all. I don't like mail-in voting. I know it's important for some people, but I don't like it. Uh, because I think going to the polls is, is an act of citizenship in a way that mailing a ballot is, is not. So I think the practices that develop citizenship, and the media is a critical part of this, uh, I think is a real problem in, in American politics. And it's not going to be solved by forcing high school teachers to teach uh, civic, civ classes in civics. That'll help, but unless you practice these things, it's not going to mean enough for you. Sid is going to be sitting right over here at this table for the next half hour. Come by and talk to him, buy a book, get him to sign it. Thank you all very much for being Thank here. Thank you, guys.